Lord Montague's warning. Zionism in search of a protector. From its inception in the late 19th century, Zionism was in search of a powerful protector under whose wing it could establish the Jewish state in Palestine. The Zionist first port of call was the Ottoman Sultan, Abdul Hamid II, who gave them short shrift when they offered to purchase the territory. There followed visits to the great powers Germany, Russia and France, but to no avail. It was the outbreak of war in 1914 that gave them their opportunity, and it was the British government that would become the protector and enabler for the realisation of their project. The Jewish Cousins Sir Herbert Samuel and Lord Edwin Montague were Jewish cousins who both served in the British government during the First World War. One was a Zionist and the other an anti-Zionist. Sir Herbert Samuel played a leading role in the formulation of the Balfour Declaration, which placed Great Britain firmly behind the establishment of the Zionist state in Palestine. Lord Montague vehemently opposed the declaration. Lord Montague's Memorandum Lord Montague's Memorandum is a lucid response by an orthodox, mainstream Jew who viewed Zionism as a dangerous political creed. He believed in a fundamental doctrine of traditional Judaism, namely that the Jews could only return to Jerusalem with the coming of the Messiah. He states with dry humour, I have never heard it suggested, even by their most fervent admirers, that either Mr Balfour or Lord Rothschild would prove to be the Messiah. Lord Montague asserted that there is not a Jewish nation. It is no more true to say that a Jewish Englishman and a Jewish Moor are of the same nation than it is to say that a Christian Englishman and a Christian Frenchman are of the same nation. He followed the orthodox doctrine that Jews are defined by Judaism. What binds the Jew is the fact that they profess to a greater or less degree the same religion. He challenged the Zionist claim to Palestine. I deny that Palestine is today associated with the Jews. It is quite true that Palestine plays a large part in Jewish history, but so it does in modern Mohammedan history. And after the time of the Jews, surely it plays a larger part than any other country in Christian history. He could see quite clearly the ethnic cleansing that would take place if the Zionist project was allowed to go ahead and found it incredible that his government should give it the green light. It seems to be inconceivable that Zionism should be officially recognised by the British government and that Mr Balfour should be authorised to say that Palestine was to be reconstituted as the national home of the Jewish people. I do not know what this involves, but I assume that it means that Mohammedans and Christians are to make way for the Jews. When the Jews are told that Palestine is their national home, you will find a population in Palestine driving out its present inhabitants, taking all the best in the country. But what exercised Lord Montague most was what he perceived to be the anti-Semitic consequences of the establishment of the Zionist state. This was clearly stated in his opening paragraph. I wish to place on record my view that the policy of His Majesty's government is anti-Semitic and in result will prove a rallying ground for anti-Semites in every country in the world. The British government did not heed Lord Montague's warning. The Zionist Settler Colony After the First World War, with the fall of the Ottomans, the British government was mandated by the newly formed League of Nations to oversee Palestine. The Balfour Declaration was incorporated into the mandate and Sir Herbert Samuel became the first High Commissioner. Lord Montague's worst fears began to be realised. 
the ethnic cleansing of the indigenous people began and after more than a hundred years is still taking place. The Palestinians have suffered the full force of the three stages of the establishment of a settler colony. Firstly, their conquest by a colony supported and armed by the British, Americans and many Western nations. Then the legalization of the colony as a state, when after World War II, the Americans forced through the newly formed United Nations the partition of Palestine, gifting the greater part of Palestine to the new state of Israel. And finally, the third stage, when the Palestinians who resisted this manifest injustice were designated terrorists in their own land. The 7th of October. What happened on the 7th of October was preceded by 17 years of persecution meted out to the Gazans by the IDF. Four times the IDF had mown the grass, killing thousands and maiming many more thousands, mostly women and children. Peaceful demonstrations were met with sniper fire, killing and maiming many hundreds. Meanwhile, Israeli settlers were illegally occupying the West Bank and East Jerusalem, with Palestinians being ethnically cleansed and many being murdered by the soldiers supporting the settlers. And the West did nothing. No reaction. No outrage at the crimes against humanity being committed in plain view. Silence. The British government in denial. When on 7th of October Hamas launched its raid, killing a number of Israeli soldiers, massacring several hundred civilians and taking hostages back into Gaza, Israel was traumatised. Its ironclad security had been breached. Humiliation and revenge produced an immediate response. The world must know that this was the greatest crime committed against the Jews since the Holocaust. It came out of a blue sky and was an act of pure savagery. Then came the stories. Forty babies beheaded. Mass rapes of women and children. Ten children tied together, tortured, burned and executed. Women having their babies torn out of their bellies and stabbed to death. Babies placed in ovens. The Prime Minister and leader of the loyal opposition, closely followed by the Archbishop of Canterbury, joined the procession of world leaders arriving in Tel Aviv to commiserate with the Israeli government and its people and pledge their undying support. The mantra began, Israel must be allowed to defend itself. The bell was rung for the finer settler colonial act to begin the ethnic cleansing and genocide of the Gazans. The stories that came out of the lurid imagination of the Israeli PR machine should have been sufficient to warn the British government to act cautiously. But it received and propagated whatever the Israelis fed them. Israel was an ally and friend. The Palestinians continued to be whatever the Israelis said they were. As I write, it is day 173 of the annihilation of Gaza. We are witnessing the complete eradication of a world. This is what genocide looks like. All the world is witnessing the total destruction of a people, their history and their entire environment. There is no hiding from the truth. The leaders are announcing publicly exactly what they are doing. Successive British governments since the Balfour Declaration have been joined at the hip with Israel and been complicit in the process required to establish a settler colony. One would have expected there to be an awakening to the reality of what is now happening. But both our government and the opposition are embedded in the Israeli narrative and in a state of denial 
regarding what is actually taking place. This has led to two disgraceful episodes. South Africa brought to the International Court of Justice the accusation of genocide against Israel. The court carefully examined the case and decided it had merit and Israel is now being investigated. The day after the court's announcement, when all attention should have been on this momentous event, the Israeli PR machine lobbed into the arena an accusation against UNRWA that a dozen of its operatives were engaged with Hamas on 7th of October. Following the Americans, the British government swallowed the bait and cancelled its funding to the UN body responsible for delivering and distributing aid to Gaza, thus further endangering the lives of the Gazans. The second disgraceful episode is the attempt to demonise the marches calling for a ceasefire. While the genocide continues and the suffering of the Gazans increases and the British government continues to arm Israel, the government, along with the opposition, turns its focus on introducing legislation to criminalise those peacefully demonstrating against the carnage. Anti-Semitism Lord Montague recognised the problem that anti-Semitism posed, but he believed that far from solving the problem, the creation of a Zionist state in Palestine would lead to a rallying ground for anti-Semites in every country in the world. He argued that if the Jews had their own state, the pressure for them to leave countries in which they were already unpopular and would now be viewed as foreigners would become overwhelming. However, he could not have imagined the Holocaust and its impact on the establishment of the Zionist state. Anti-Semitism was outlawed in every Western country and blind support given to the Zionist state as a safe haven for the Jews who would now come under the absolute protection of the West. Lord Montague knew little about Arab Jewry, which did not share the Western narrative of persecution. A great tragedy unfolded as Zionism exported the curse of anti-Semitism to the Arab world, separating the Jews from their Arab cultures and driving them into the Jewish state. Lord Montague would not have been surprised at the growth of Israel into a racist apartheid state, harbouring a fanatical religious sect bent on genocide in order to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. However, I believe he would have been astonished at the continuing complicity of the British government. This epic tragedy is now playing out. Israel has proclaimed to the world that to be anti-Israel is to be anti-Semitic. They have attempted to gather all Jews into their project. The world is horrified by the unfolding of one of the great crimes of history. Israel is now isolated and Jews everywhere are suffering an exponential rise in anti-Semitism.